Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this forum. My name is Mark Oakley, and I'm the Canon Treasurer here at the Cathedral, and it's my great privilege and uh, delight to be able to welcome you here, but also to welcome our speaker today, Bishop Richard Harris, who will be known to all of you, I'm sure, very distinguished theologian and ethicist, former Bishop of Oxford. He's just told me, by the way, he doesn't want a long introduction, so I'm whittling everything I have down uh, into, the, into the pure basics. But you wouldn't be able uh, to stand here and not introduce him in the strongest um, terms as somebody who really has helped the church uh, think through very complex issues, but always in a very accessible, non-patronising way. When I went to King's College London uh, to read theology, I remember my first day walking along the corridor and seeing a man in a black cassock, and I said, who's that? And they said, it's the Dean, it's the Dean. And I said, he looks very distinguished, and uh, I'm slightly in awe of him. And it turned out to be uh, Bishop Richard Harris. And I have to say, 25 years later, I'm now sitting next to him, and nothing's really changed. <laughs> uh, with that, I'm simply going to ask him now to come and introduce his recent book, The Reenchantment of Morality, Wisdom for a Troubled World. Would you please welcome? Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, Mark, for that admirable introduction. Can everybody hear quite clearly at the back? You probably know the story of the bishop who tapped a mic and all over the auditorium came the words, I think there's a fault in this mic. And of course, the, the audience were rather well trained liturgically, as well as being good Anglicans, and they were, and also with you. <laughs> So I think you probably all agree with me that life is simply uh, a question of making one decision after another. Every day is filled with thousands of decisions. Coming here this morning, for instance, I had to decide whether to take the district line or to go on the Piccadilly line and change on the central line. Life is full of uh, decisions. Sometimes those decisions have momentous consequences for our lives, uh, and sometimes those decisions have another dimension to them. We feel somehow it would be right to do something or it would be wrong to do something. Now ethics is, as I would define it, the study of what makes an action right or wrong. For most of our decisions, what makes an action right or wrong, I suppose, is totting up the consequences for or against. I once heard John Major on the radio telling listeners how he made decisions. He said he got out an envelope, put a line down the middle, on one side he put all the reasons for, and on the other side he put all the reasons against. I thought it's a wonderfully clear way how we make ordinary everyday decisions. And that's given rise to a particular ethical theory called consequentialism or utilitarianism. For such people, uh, what makes an action right or wrong is whether the consequences add up to the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Now, if that points to what ethics is, a study of what makes an action right or wrong, clearly Christian ethics is what makes an action right or wrong from a Christian point of view. Now, if you went out to St Paul's and you tapped, met somebody in the street and said, uh, from a Christian point of view, what do you think makes an action right or wrong? If people had had any contact with the Christian faith, I suspect they would say, well, it's one of the Ten Commandments, isn't it? Or, it's right if God commands it, it's wrong if God forbids it. The trouble is, what claims to be God's command could be, or could strike you, as morally wrong. And supposing, uh, for instance, you read in the Bible or a sacred scripture that the creator of the heaven and earth commands something, and actually you feel that's morally wrong. What do you do? And I suppose in the end you have to make up your mind whether you trust your own conscience, as we say, that's a, that's a slightly misleading, misleading phrase, whether you trust your own moral judgment 
or whether you trust what purports to be a command of God. Because we know from the Nuremberg trials after World War II that obedience to a superior command does not let the person off the hook. It's no defence to claim that you are simply obeying a command. And if that applies to human laws, presumably it applies also to what purports to be divine laws. Now you can see this, this immediately sets up a problem for a religious believer. If you begin by trusting your own moral judgment, where does this leave God? After all, God by definition is meant to have nothing subordinate or subservient to him. Not, God is not meant to be accountable to anybody or anything. That's what makes God, God. Well, I think that there is some justification for the point of view that I have just suggested uh, in the Bible itself, particularly in the Psalms, because many times in the Psalms, the Psalmist seems to appeal to a standard of God to which God himself must pay attention. Great cries like, will not the God of the earth do justice? Seems to imply, doesn't it, that there's a standard of justice to which God himself must uh, uh, adhere. But as I say, this sets up a, a problem. How do we get round this problem? I would suggest uh, that any religious faith, certainly the Christian faith, depends upon making a prior moral judgment that that reality to which one gives one's ultimate allegiance is good, all good, are true and everlasting good. I take seriously what purports to be divine commands because, first of all, I've made a prior judgment that I believe that God is good, all good, are true and everlasting good. And obviously I believe that uh, on the basis of what Christ has revealed of God and what he has uh, done for us to bring about uh, our, our human uh, redemption. And that brings out one very, very fundamental point. It means that the pattern of Christian ethical thinking uh, is one of recognition and response. It's recognizing where ultimate good lies and wanting to respond to it in some way. It is therefore through and through a theological ethic. And that is the pattern you get both in the Hebrew Scriptures and in the New Testament. In the Old Testament we read, You shall be holy, for the Lord your God is holy. In the New Testament Jesus uh, said, You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And if you perhaps remember when St Paul is wanting to get that first group of Christians to do things, uh, he doesn't just say, uh, let us say, be humble. He doesn't just say be humble. Uh, he says, let have this mind amongst yourselves which you have in Christ Jesus, that he was, who was equal with God did not snatch at equality with God, but humbled himself, emptied himself and humbled himself and became a human being. Uh, in other words, he appeals to the humility of God, uh, which he wants reflected uh, in uh, us. So, uh, the Christian ethic then is a theological ethic uh, through uh, and through. And you can talk about that response uh, in different ways. You can talk about obeying the will of God. You can talk about imitating Christ. A very famous book by Timothy Kempis called The Imitation of Christ. Uh, you can talk about following Jesus. You can talk about letting Christ work in you and through, through you. There are very many different ways in which we can talk about it, but the pattern is the same. Now my book is called uh, The Reenchantment of Mora Morality because I believe, and I hope you will have gathered the gist of it from what I've said so far, Christian ethics isn't just a, a kind of bare bones morality. Ethics is, as it were, subsumed and taken into an overall vision uh, of what it means to be a human being. 
We have an enchanted view of the universe. We have an enchanted view of what life is like. We have an enchanted view of what it is to be a human being made in the image of God and called to grow into his likeness. We have this wonderful vision of what life is about and what it is to be a human being. That's why Christian ethics is an enchanted uh, ethics and why in the modern world we need to talk about the re-enchantment of morality to take bare bones morality into a wider vision of what it is about. Now that very interesting thinker Roger Scruton has written uh, a book just recently called The Face of God and in that book he's highly critical of all attempts to explain human behavior in evolutionary terms. He's highly critical of all forms of reductionism, those scientific studies which say that well simply our thinking is simply a series uh, of electrical impulses in the brain or our behavior to do this is simply uh, a, a, a chemical process here. He's highly critical of all attempts to simply equate human behavior uh, with other members of the animal species. And all these uh, attempts made, of course, only by some kind of scientific studies, not all, he calls in a very telling phrase, the charm of disenchantment. The charm of disenchantment. The charm is to strip human beings of all enchantment so that we're seen exactly the same as any other species on the planet. And he goes on to say, uh, one of the consequences of this, human nature wants something to live up to, becomes something to live down to instead. It makes cynicism respectable and degeneracy chic. Now it seems to me that that is a very, very powerful indictment of certain modern ways of looking at human life. So our way is that we are human beings made in the image of God and we have therefore fundamental dignity at every stage of our lives simply because uh, of that. Now Christian ethics has both a personal dimension and a social dimension. It's obvious the Christian ethics has a personal dimension. It is, if you like, about following Jesus or allowing Christ to work in one or whatever it is. But it also has a social dimension. It has things to say about society and how society should be or uh, uh, ordered because we're not simply isolated individuals. We are always human, we are always persons in relationship to other persons. We only become persons in and through our relationships with other persons. And therefore, these human communities are fundamental to our life and human communities organized on a particular scale, scale provide a, a society. The trouble is, as soon as we start thinking about what this means in practice, both for personal ethics and even more for social ethics, some major difficulties appear. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to show that things are much more complicated than most people thought. If you wanted, if you just want something very uncomplicated, probably now is the point to leave. Because <laughs> it's not that what I'm going to say is difficult, it's very easy to understand. No difficulty about understanding. But I have to point out that Christian ethics uh, is more complex than a lot of other people, a lot of people think. First of all, you can't have read the New Testament without getting an overwhelming impression that the teaching of Christ is pretty radical. If you read the New Testament, it's a very radical teaching. How do you apply that to ordinary everyday life? Secondly, those first Christians believed that Christ would come again in glory sooner rather than later. They believed that the consummation of all things was at hand. And this meant that they, no more than Christ, wanted to legislate for society long term. The New Testament says 
very, very little, virtually nothing about you know, what might be right or wrong in the way of ordering society in the long term. They were concerned with the sort of sense of urgency here and now, to follow Jesus Christ with a sense of urgency here uh, and now. And this means uh, that it's not always difficult or easy to, to simply read off from the New Testament what might be right or wrong from a Christian point of view in the world uh, today. So what did the early church do when it couldn't find any clear teaching in the New Testament and even sometimes when it did, what did it do? It borrowed the best standards from the Romano Christian world. In the same way that the early church had no scruples at all about taking over classical culture and classical literature and as it were baptizing it, incorporating it into Christianity and even more some of the best philosophy, Platonism, later on Aristotelianism, they had no scruples about taking of the best secular thought, the best secular values and taking it into the Christian faith and they did that in the New Testament itself, some of the most basic, basic down-to-earth teaching in the New Testament uh, is pretty identical with what the best teaching was in the Romano Christian world uh, at, the, uh, at that time. Now, I don't think as Christians we should have any worry or difficulty about that. Because it's always been a fundamental teaching of the Christian faith that simply by virtue of our human nature, we have some capacity for moral discernment. All right, sometimes we're blind, sometimes we see through a glass, very, through a glass that's very dark indeed, and we can twist and turn and all that. But nevertheless, by virtue of the fact that we are human beings, we have some capacity for moral discernment, whether we believe in God or, or, or not. Traditionally, that's part of what's been meant when Christians have talked about a natural law. Uh, it is natural to human beings to be able to make moral judgments. It belongs to our human nature uh, as such. And therefore, I don't have any uh, problem uh, at all with where I began this, this afternoon by suggesting uh, that we have to begin with our own uh, moral uh, judgment, nor do I have any problem at all about recognising what might be valid uh, in secular viewpoints. Now, one of the features of our present time, as we know, is the extraordinary hostility uh, between uh, advocates of uh, what I call uh, 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 the new atheism, the attack dogs of the new atheism uh, and, and Christianity. And what distinguishes the new atheism from old atheism is that they don't just believe that a religious view of the world is untrue, they believe it is immoral. The, pe the attacks of people like Dawkins and Hitchens are very fierce they, because they think that Christianity is evil. Hitchens uses the phrase, it's a kind of poison which needs to be drained from uh, society. Now in reaction to that, some Christians say, well unless you believe in God, you have no basis for your moral judgments at all. Uh, it's only if you believe in God who's the source and stand of all goodness do you have any firm basis for your morality and your morality therefore doesn't uh, count for anything at all. Now I think that both those extreme points of view are wrong. I think we should recognise and affirm and celebrate good values, whoever puts them forward, first of all. We should ha not do that in any kind of uh, begrudging way either. We should recognise, affirm and celebrate good values, whoever puts them forward. They are good values and I've already suggested it belongs to us by virtue of our human nature to do that. But of course, from a Christian point of view, having said that, uh, we have this wider vision of what it is to be uh, a human being, which gives those values a particular kind of resonance, which perhaps inserts new values uh, and sort of shifts our whole perspective and way of looking at on things. But if you want a kind of analogy as to how you should understand the relationship between a secular-based ethics and a Christian-based ethics, 
And you want to get away from all this claiming of the high moral ground with the attack dogs and the new atheism claiming, well, they've got the morality and Christians saying, no, we've got the true morality and you're really immoral. Get, if you want to get away from that, the analogy I would use is the relationship between a, 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 a beautiful melody, a beautiful theme of music and the symphony. Secular ethics, as it were, hears this wonderful music and responds to it and celebrates it, perhaps sings it. Uh, but from a Christian point of view, I believe that we know where that theme of music comes from. We know the symphony. We know the whole uh, of which that is but a part. That, at any rate, is how I would uh, understand the relationship between uh, the, the, the two. Um, I've suggested uh, that there is both a personal ethics uh, and a Christian social ethics uh, and it obviously uh, applying uh, or looking at the Bible and trying to draw social ethics in the Bible is more difficult in the case of social ethics than it is in terms of personal ethics. In my book I look at the four great drivers of human behaviour. I don't know what you would regard as the four great drivers of human behavior. The four I've chosen are sex, money, power, and fame. Those are the four that I discuss in my book. And what I'd like to say is they all have a personal di dimension, uh, but they all actually all have a social dimension as well. Obviously sex, that is part of one's Christian discipleship, how one uh, regards one's sexuality and how one behaves sexuality. But society has to make laws and arrangements for marriage. It has to control or ban things like pornography or prostitution or whatever. So there is a social dimension as well as a personal dimension in all these things, uh, money, sex, fame and, uh, and, and, and power. That is what I've suggested and what I've tried to do uh, in the book. Now, I've suggested as far as personal ethics, obviously uh, our starting point is the dignity and worth of other people. And to love other people uh, is to have that firmly in mind uh, and to have the, the well-being and the happiness of that person or group of people uh, in mind. That is the starting point. But of course it is only the starting point. If you're actually trying to work out in what does the well-being and the happiness of that person consist, you have to sometimes think quite hard. It doesn't come to you on ticker tape in, terms of the, in, in front of your mind. You sometimes have to think hard what is in the best interest of the well-being uh, of other people. Now when it comes to social ethics, obviously I'm not dealing with all these subjects in detail now because I'm drawing to a conclusion so that we can uh, open up to some uh, discussion. But when it comes to um, social ethics, uh, which is fundamental, just to remind you, because we are persons only in and through our relationship with other persons. The person I'm a huge admirer of, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, wrote what I think is still the best defense of democracy in a book called The Children of Light and Children of Darkness. And uh, in that book, he said, man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible man's inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. And I think that that extraordinarily well-balanced statement gets it just right and sums up so beautifully, succinctly, the Christian understanding of what it means to be a human being in society. Man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible. We have a good side of us. We have an idealistic stride in all of us and we don't want to forget that and become so pessimistic that we, we forget that. But at the same time, the Christian faith has always wanted to stress that they're weak. We're weak as human beings, fallible, flawed. We very often pursue our own interests too ruthlessly expensive of other people and so on. And so the second half of that aphorism of Niebuhr goes, man's inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. And the, you know, the book is about democracy. What he's referring to, uh, of course, uh, is the fact 
that one of the fundamental features of democracy, perhaps the most important, is that you have checks and balances on the power of government. You have an independent judiciary, you have an independent legislature, um, it's what the Americans call a separation of powers, so the tyranny cannot arise. That's one of the fundamental points of democracy. A true democracy is there not just to express the wishes of people, uh, but it is also to stop any kind of tyranny uh, arising. Now this view of human beings, which I think comes from the Christian faith, is what I would call a hopeful realism. It avoids cynicism on the one hand, it's a hopeful realism, and it avoids mere sentimentality uh, on the other. It is also a realism. And I think that is the basic stance with which a Christian should approach the ordering of uh, society. So, so therefore to sum up in order that we can go into some uh, discussion together, I've suggested basically five fundamental features which run uh, through uh, my book. First of all, the Christian ethics is a theological ethic. It is an ethic based on the pattern of recognition uh, and response. Recognizing that the God in Jesus Christ is our good, our true good, uh, our everlasting good, we desire to respond to that with our whole life. Secondly, it gives us a vision of what it is to be a human being. It is an enchanted ethic in contrast to so much uh, of today's discussion of human beings which think of us uh, in reductionist terms. In terms of both personal ethics and uh, social ethics, the fundamental basis must be the dignity and worth of every single human life uh, at every stage of that life. And the forefront of our minds we have the desire for the happiness and well-being of other people, which is presumably what we mean by, by love. But in contrast to what too many people have, have said, uh, and, in, and along the lines of what a, a, a philosopher I must uh, much respect once said, uh, love does not answer the questions. It means that you have in the forefront of your mind the desire for the well-being of happiness of others, but it opens up all the old questions about what, in what way we can best serve the well-being of happiness in others, and when it concerns society as a whole, that's sometimes a very, very complex issue. And fifthly, I suggested that the Christian understanding of what it means to be a human being in society avoids cynicism on the one hand and sentimentality other, on the other and offers a hopeful realism because it recognizes that within all of us there are what the Jews call a Yetzer Hara and a Yetzer uh, Ha, what is it now, I've forgotten it. Yetzer Hara and Yetzer Ha too. A good inclination and a bad inclination. Uh, and when we're ordering our society, we have to order society in a way that we encourage people's good inclination uh, and that we have to have curbs and checks uh, on our inclination to do harm to other people. So Mark, I think that's enough to get people going with some kind of discussion and questions, at least I, I hope it is. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, and uh, we've got some time for questions, and uh, Bishop Richard's going to stay by the mic so you can actually hear his answers. And I'm going to ask you, please, uh, to raise your hand if you wish to ask a question, but if I may uh, just start us off. Um, in your book, you talk about there being no strong, no one strong inspiration out there that, that provides a sort of... Um, a moral framework for people anymore. You, you talk about living on moral credit. Yeah. And uh, I was very conscious of this uh, teaching some A-level students about a year ago when they asked me, when we were talking about these issues, look, the basic question is why should we be moral? What's the point? What, what would you answer? Well, first of all, uh, I think it is uh, true, and this is not just as it were a religious believer sort of doomsday scenario, it is, uh, it is true uh, and it's not surprising that it's true that our society is uh, living 
uh, on moral credit, as you have just referred to it, it, it there. Um, because of the, the, the Christian faith, and to be fair, also the very strongly based uh, moral humanism, which grew up in the 19th century, uh, there is a substratum in our society uh, of, 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 of moral conviction. It's the, it, it is there. But I suspect it is being used up. It's interesting that Seamus Heaney, the very distinguished poet, said precisely that. He, he put it, he said, our society is living on an unconscious, an unconscious morality. And he went on to say, I think my children's children will not have that. And there are all sorts of uh, signs uh, in our society that that is, uh, that is so. I mean, you could pick thousands of things and no doubt we'll be refer referring to them, but the latest that caught my mind was the figures yesterday, the very high and growing percentage of students at university caught cheating. Um, I'm mean, very sorry to see that uh, King's London sent down 40 people last year for cheating. Uh, mind you, of course, if they come up high, high on the league, it might be a good idea because at least they're catching them. What about these universities where they're not catching them? So these leagues so can be a bit misleading, but I mean, that for me is a shocking, uh, shocking figure, uh, first, first of all. Um, but your question went, went wider than that, as to what should be the motivation? Why should people be good uh, and, and evil? Uh, or rather, why should they seek to do what is right and avoid what is evil? And why should they pursue uh, the good? The Christian answer I have given, I, I, I've given you because we recognize the goodness of God and we want to respond to that. Uh, we, may, we recognize we're made in his image. We want to grow in his likeness. We want to allow him to use, work his purpose, good purpose in and through us. But for a secular minded person who has no religious belief, I think quite simply, they simply have to come up with their own answer. Uh, because th there's, no, there's no other overall answer. I mean, you may give a, a purely utilitarian answer. Um, you might decide, well, uh, I'll, be, I'll be good uh, because I want other people to go be, you know, I'll treat other people decently because I want them to be, treat me uh, decently. Um, and then perhaps you might pose the question, well, why do you want them, why do you want to be treated decently? I mean, you could, the point is you can, go, you can go back and back and back and you can find, you can eventually come a point where you just have to choose, I think. Now I've just read a very interesting book by the very distinguished American professor, Professor Ronald Dworkin, who is clearly not a religious believer, but he has a very, very carefully worked out and rich view of life, uh, ethical view of life. Um, and he says in that book, poses that question, you know, well, why should one be concerned about an ethical view of life? It's clearly very important to him. And his answer for him is because he wants to live a life that he can take pride in. That's his answer. Uh, he wants to live life that he takes pride in and to, for him uh, a life to take pride in is a life when you, where you, in which you recognise the rights of other people and you recognise your duties towards them. That's his answer. But it seems to me uh, in the end a secular person simply has to choose and it might be like Ronald Dworkin did or it might be some other, uh, other reason. Um, my question of course would be well you know, why do you want to live a life to take pride in? Why does it, why does it matter? Um, uh, and I would want to go on beyond that and say, uh, have you got an over-explanatory -exp view of human existence uh, in which our desire to live lives which we take pride in actually makes sense? Yes, there's a gentleman there and a lady there. Yes, also pl plenty of time for questions. Yes. Well, I think what the situation you described, of course, is very widespread today and, and has be, really been in our society much more widespread for the last hundred years or so. 
Um, uh, it was very succinctly put by Attlee, the Prime Minister after World War II. Christian ethics, fine, he said, can't take all the mumbo jumbo. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, no, we just have to recognise that situation. And first of all, uh, from what I've said before, I would have affirmed the validity of their own moral capacity for moral discernment. I wouldn't want to, un I wouldn't want to undermine that or begrudge it. Say, no, that's, that's good. Uh, and uh, in the end, one has to say, uh, you know, I believe certain things to be true, not in a literalistic way, but if you what you might call a symbolic realism, you talked about uh, the ascension and things like this. Well, you know, what, of course, what one means by them, but that's another whole, uh, that's a, another whole discussion. If I think I wanted to get the person to move on a bit, um, I would ask, I, I would want them to kind of reflect a little bit uh, about the sense of obligation they feel. Why, why, where does this sense of obligation come from? Why do they have this desire to live a, 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 moral, a moral life? Um, there is something haunting uh, uh, about it. It belongs to our, our human life. And does that have a sort of grounding elsewhere? I think that's, the, that's all, I could, all I could do, I'm afraid. Good. Well, I'll, I'll respond to that first, actually, because it's a very important point. Too many people think that Christian ethics uh, is uh, uh, about an ethics which is done kind of in the fear of God or to obtain heaven or to avoid hell. That seems to me to be a caricature and we should, we should, res we should resist that. Uh, that, is, that is not Christian ethics. Uh, we do things because, as you put it quite rightly, because they're right to do. Um, and there's, there's be no better reason for doing something that it is simply uh, right right to do. If you're, if you're kind to somebody, um, what better uh, reason there is there than the fact that there is no reason for doing it? Uh, I think I put in my book, you know, the best reason is that there is no reason. They are, are there uh, and you, you recognise there with a particular kind of need and you want to meet that need with an act of kindness or sensitivity or gentleness or, or whatever, it, whatever it is. That, and I would say that, that the best ethics, both Christian and non-Christian, does have that feature. The difference is, what we would hope, that as a Christian view of things, uh, first of all, it helps to open one's eyes to the reality of the other. It helps to keep one morally sensitive. It helps to give one the grace to act in that way. What I haven't talked about at all, but perhaps should have done a bit more, is that Christian ethics is just as much about receiving the grace of God to do what is right as it is about trying to illuminate our, illuminate our minds to tell us what is right. And indeed, if you look through Christian literature, and rather more about the grace of God to help one do one what, it, what is right. So uh, perhaps that's all I can say in response, to, 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 because I want to, uh, to I'll take the next lady there now, if I may. Yeah. Well, my own view, quite simple, was that the, the protesters acted uh, as the voice uh, of billions of people around the world who are absolutely scandalised by the present operation, the present market, the present financial system. And of course, although they were a ragtag bobtail of, of people in terms of views, not as people, but in terms of, of views from sort of fairly loose anarchy on the one, 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 one hand, um, nevertheless, they, they were voicing the pain of billions of, uh, of people. That's the, way I th that's, what, that's the way I look at it. And there was a lady there on the end there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we need a good spring. Yeah, we need a good spring clean all the time. We, of course, it does. We need a we're in constant need of uh, of renewal. And I'm sympathetic with, with with what you say. Of course, first of all, I mean you raised several points. I mean there are, there are real difficulties about believing Christianity. Let's not get away from it right from the word go. People talked about the scandal of particularity, uh, the fact the Christian Church does claim that in a unique kind of way, 
Jesus reveals God uh, in, in, a, in a way which is more distinctive and radical than all of us, all of us in some way reveal God. But um, all I can say fr from my point of view is it's only on the basis of that belief that I can believe in God at all. But I won't pursue that further. But in relation to your other two points, the church has been terribly flawed in the past, and no doubt it is also. And of course, we have to uh, acknowledge that, um, not least, of course, uh, the contribution that anti Judaism, uh, the teaching of anti Judaism, the teaching of contempt to Jews, helped to pre prepare the ground for anti Semitism. Um, all sorts of ways the church's uh, record is, is, is bad. Uh, and in relation to your last point, of course, we have had to rethink our cosmology. But um, that's no fundamental problem. The number of uh, percentage of believing scientists in the population is about the same as other people. No, not much really higher or less. I mean, it, 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 it's possible to rethink these things. So, I'm sorry, there's quite a lot of questions you were asking there, but um, we'll take that lady there and then, and then the, yeah, and then I must go to the back. I mustn't hog, hog people in the front. Yes. Well, um, I'm afraid that probably the children have no morals at all because the adults who've been their role example models for them don't have morals either. I mean, and this, this, it's no good. Just it, we know it's not no good. Just blaming uh, children. Um, and um, I, I, one, it seems to me that one of the one of the fundamental features that's gone wrong in our society in recent years is that people have thought that if it's if it's legal, it's enough. If you take the the parliamentary expenses scandal, for example, most MPs pursued what they thought were the rules and procedures of the time. But it struck the wider public as dishonourable. They said it, their view was, well, it may have been legal, you know, uh, finally legal in some cases, but nevertheless struck most people as being not right, as dishonourable. And I think that that attitude has been prevalent not only with parliamentary, in Parliament, but also so much in our economic life uh, and, and elsewhere. People really do, see what they can, they can get away with. Uh, and what we need to do is recreate a, a, a new ethos, a new ethos at every level in our society, family level, local communities in the country as, as a whole, where people don't just say, what can I get away with? Is it legal? But first of all, you know, is it actually right? Is it honourable? No, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Makes a very, you've made a very, very important uh, point. Christianity has always emphasised the dark side of life. It's always emphasised there is a tragic dimension uh, to human uh, life, and that originates with, within us, not just by virtue of our, our, our finitude. Um, and we take this into, into account, and that's why... Uh, we stress our need for the grace of, of God in our personal endeavour uh, and the need in society not to have a totally utopian view of society. And you're quite right, what went wrong with, the, uh, with, with Soviet-style communism uh, was not uh, the fact that it was atheistic, uh, and it, wasn't, it didn't help that it was atheistic, but that's not the fundamental, fundamental problem. Uh, was that the idea of the advance guard of the proletariat seizing power with no checks or balances did not do justice to the fact that if people seize power uh, and run a country uh, in the name of whatever it is, in the end they, they run it for their own interests. I am by uh, temperament uh, a believer in liberal interventionism, as it's called. Uh, that is, uh, if there is a, a terrible humanitarian issue in some country, uh, I don't think the international community can simply stand aside for it. I think uh, that we have to work as an international community through the United Nations uh, in order to try to 
stop genocide, if it's genocide that's going, or to alleviate the situation, whatever it is. The problem is, or there are several pr problems, is, it, but uh, one, one of them is, of course, uh, these situations are always very, very uh, complex. Now, there are terrible things going on in Syria at the moment, as we know. Uh, but I think the view of the international community at the moment is, probably rightly, that any sort of attempt to intervene militarily in Syria would bring about a far worse state than we've got at the moment. Uh, and many would say that that has happened as a result of the invasion of Iraq. So there's no, the, the, there are, you know, there are, those sort of decisions always involve, as, as it were, assessing one set of consequences <laughs> against another, uh, and it's usually a question of what is the least evil course of action. Now I think the, the jury is still out on Libya, uh, but uh, Libya at least is not a total disaster yet. Uh, and there's no reason why it should be a total disaster. So I personally, if you want my own view, and, and I, I oppose the uh, invasion of uh, Iraq. Uh, I supported the intervention in Libya. Uh, I don't think we should intervene in Syria, and I certainly don't think we should bomb Iran, but that's, that's only my human fallible judgment. Your view would be as good as mine. I, yes, yeah, no, I quite agree. I think that there's um, a very close link between aesthetics um, and uh, spiritual response. One of my favorite sayings is from St. Augustine where he addresses God, O thou beauty most ancient and withal so fresh. And the early church took beauty far more seriously uh, than we do now seriously and they saw that beauty, truth, and goodness were integrally linked and all have their uh, source and origin uh, within, within God. Our response to beauty is akin to our response to, to, to God. And God, as we believe, well, we, we, we tend to talk about the glory of God, but what I, what I would define the glory of God, that sublime conjunction of truth, beauty, and goodness, which makes up the glory of God. But perhaps we can have a word. I mean, I, d I think it's not quite true that the Church of England uh, ignored the uh, occupying protesters. There was a lot of sympathy for them, I think, quite widely. Well, I think you, you put, put it very, very, very well. I mean, uh, in terms of, you, I think you explained the, the Islamic position uh, very, very, very clearly. Let me say, first of all, I'm a firm believer in life after death, in heaven and, and hell. Uh, I firmly believe them. Um, it depends what you mean by hell, of course, but I'm quite certain uh, that this life is not the only life there is. But uh, what Christianity says is that we can be taken up into this eternal life here and now. Uh, in and through Christ, we come to share in the eternal life of Christ here and now. Uh, which has a dimension beyond death, but we don't have to uh, wait until death in order to enter uh, eternal life because it is in and through our relationship with Christ now that we are brought into this eternal relationship with, with God. That seems to me that what Christianity is saying. <clears throat> The only thing you might want to say about the book is, of course, that it, it, uh, um, it did one that won the theatre. It is shortlisted for the theological. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. I will do. <laughs> I'm sorry that time has come to an end, but I just wanted to, on your behalf, um, thank uh, Lord Harris for uh, this hour he spent with us. Um, I've read his writings for a long time now, and one of the things I've always been struck by is. Well, two things, really. The first is that by his focus on ethics, um, he's, he's very much always reminding us that the best things in life are not things, uh, but that it's about relationships and it's about um, uh, responding to the grace of God. And his ability to make 
the subject of morality, something ultimately serious rather than sensational, uh, to me is hugely important at the present time. It's the first thing I'd like to say uh, in thanks to him. The second is that uh, those of us who are from uh, the Anglican tradition here, I think he is very Anglican. In what I mean by that is he's very unafraid to reason and he's unashamed to adore. And Anglican theology at its best, and there is bad Anglican theology, but at its best is respectful of tradition, it's in dialogue with the scriptures, it's reasoned, it's sensitive to human experience, and it helps us to question uh, critically, but ultimately tries to help us live faithfully. And I think that is something absolutely embodied uh, in the man we call Richard Harris. And I just want to thank him for that too. So on your behalf, and I'd like to thank you very much for your questions um, uh, today as well, I'd like to thank uh, Richard Harris and to tell you that um, it was shortlisted for the Ramsey Prize. Uh, <laughs> and you can see why by buying it afterwards uh, if you'd like to. And I believe the, the books are at the back. Or in the shop. In the, oh, we'll bring them on this table for you if you'd like to buy uh, a copy. How, uh, much is, how much is it? Ten ninety nine. Bargain. And then, if you would like to uh, see this talk again on the St Paul's website, then you can do so. And of course, all the other previous ones as well. So, thank you very much for coming today, and thank you again to Richard Harris.